Hey guys, my name's Janice. I am with Ozark Family Homestead. We have a channel on YouTube and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. We're talking meat birds. I don't know if you guys are too familiar with meat birds or if this is a whole new experience for you, but that's what we're going to get into today. I wanted to introduce myself first. So I'm Janice. I've been married to Sean for 20 years now. And we have seven children. Hi, this, Mama. Hi, baby. Hi. That was good timing, huh? That's the two-year-old. The seven children range from age 18 down to two. We have a homestead in the Missouri Ozarks. We own 37 acres, but really only homestead 30 of the acreage here. And we have chickens and ducks and turkeys and sheep and goats and a milk cow and rabbits and dogs and cats what am i forgetting <laughs> we have lots of animals so but we do do both egg layers and meat birds and that's what we're going to talk about today so let's get started okay let's start off with talking about why you might want to raise meat birds in the first place why not just go buy it from the store and be done with it because you have that option and we took that option for a long long time so I'll start off with telling you what our family's reason was for going ahead and starting to raise our own meat birds and then we'll talk about some of the other reasons that other people that you might be that might be your reason for going ahead and getting into this okay so our family Again, we're a large family. We go through a lot of food. And you guys lived through 2020. And you know it was kind of crazy. And there was not always access to the things you wanted in the grocery store. Okay, we experienced that too. So 2020 is really when we decided to go ahead and start raising our own meat birds. Our reason was food security. Prior to that, we would drive to another farm that a lovely family owned. It was two hours away, and they raised meat birds, and we would purchase a year's worth of whole fryer meat bird chickens from them. And it was great. We paid money for it, but it was worth it for us to have that good quality home-raised meat from another family that we knew. We loved that system until we couldn't get the things we wanted in the grocery store and that caused us to really reevaluate how dependent we wanted to be even on another farm that was two hours away. So that's when we got our first set of meat birds and we've been getting them every year ever since then. Now there is a secondary reason for us having meat birds. Really it's for us doing everything that we're doing here on our homestead. And that is for our children's education. It is really, really important to us that our children know where their food comes from. I don't want them to just think a bag of chicken nuggets comes from a chicken nugget factory and that's it. I want them to know what it goes into raising an animal, processing an animal, and using it. That is important to me. So that is a secondary reason for us is the children's education. So, what are some other reasons that other people might be getting into meat birds? I think a lot of people do it planning to save money. They think if they raise these birds themselves, if they put in the time and energy to do it themselves, then they will have a uh, return on investment there. And that's their motivation for getting meat birds. The other reason might be the quality of meat. If you want a higher quality. I think it's pretty well understood that the meat, conventionally raised meat in the grocery stores is not the best quality, if you know what I mean. That people will get into raising meat birds thinking, I can use a certain kind of animal feed. I can set my chickens up in a way that is a healthier environment than a factory farming might be. And in the end, they would end up with a higher quality of meat for their family. So perhaps that's your motivation for getting into this too. 
And those are all, those are great reasons to get into doing meat birds for yourself. The last reason I could come up with is maybe you just want a hobby. Maybe you enjoy chickens and you enjoy homesteading things in general and that is just a natural offshoot of that. So some people may do it as a hobby and that is just perfectly fine. So whatever your reason, be thinking about what your main motivation is because that is going to affect all these things that we're going to be talking about next on this discussion which birds you get and how you raise them and all those things. We're going to be discussing those here in just a little bit. But think about your why. And when you have decided your why, then we can move on to the next step. Okay, the next thing I want to touch on is the differences between egg-laying chicks and meat bird chicks because they are very different. And I wanted to start off, I'm going to go in the shop building right back here behind me and show you some egg layers that we have hatched out and how cute and sweet they are. And then I will take you out and show you the meat birds that we currently have growing out in one of the pastures. And you can see the difference for yourself. So here we go. Okay, these are some egg layers that we have hatched out in our incubator. This is from our own flock, which, so these are just a barnyard mix here. And what we primarily have is Rhode Island Reds, Buff Orpingtons, and Black Australorps in our egg laying flock. So these are mixtures of those birds. But these birds here are almost four weeks old. And soon they'll be switched out to a pasture in a chicken tractor. So they will be outside here in just another day or two. But these birds, they're sweet. They they get along. They're just lovely. <laughs> they're pretty. And they're not aggressive. And they're really just a joy to have around. They seem to get along pretty well with one another. And we'll show you the difference between these and some Cornish Cross meat birds here in just a minute. Okay. Behind me, we have our Cornish Cross meat birds, and right now they're about six weeks old. But what I've been doing is within these past six weeks, I've been taking little snippets of videos that I'm hoping to show you guys different aspects of raising meat birds because I knew this discussion was coming up. So throughout this video today, you're gonna see little snippets as these birds have gotten older through these last six weeks. What we're going to do right now is go get a closer look at these meat birds so we can look at what some of the differences might be between them and those cute little egg layers that you just saw. Well, they're coming up here to meet me at the gate. Let's see if we can even get in. Okay, let's look at these guys a little bit closer. If you'll notice, a lot of them have bald spots on them. They are not all fluffed out with feathers like the egg layers are. <laughs> Abigail's trying to catch one for me. <laughs> it's not, it's not gonna work, baby. So they have bald spots on them. They're not quite as pretty as other egg layers, as other breeds are. So there is a difference in their appearance. Oh, you got one. I don't think it likes it though. <laughs> They're too scared for you, yes. Okay, so their appearance is different. They have a different appearance than your typical egg layers. There's also a difference in their longevity. They are not gonna have the long lifespan. These egg layer, these meat birds are not gonna live a long life like your egg layers will. These Cornish Cross are designed for butchering around eight weeks of age and after those eight weeks, they are gonna decline in health. There's gonna be health issues that go along with these birds also that egg layers typically do not have. They don't wanna be caught, Abigail. Oh. <laughs> there will be problems with their legs, especially if you keep them in confinement where they cannot get exercise and if they're fed 
too much. If they're fed too much, there's one up close, baby. Yeah, there's a good Cornish cross right there. Look what you did. <laughs> All right, we can go ahead and let it down. So yes, there could be leg problems, especially if they're kept in confinement and if they're fed too much. Um, they'll have trouble with their legs supporting themselves. So you will need to watch out for that with meat birds. And temperament. Our, well, generally speaking, our egg layers, <laughs> look at them go. Our egg layers are pretty sweet. They, they don't, they aren't too interested in us unless they've gone broody. Now these meat birds, when you are bringing them food, they are aggressive. They have drawn blood when my husband is going in to feed them. They will swarm him. And <laughs> he says they're like little velociraptors. Yeah, they are. They are. Run, Abigail, run. So there is a temperament difference with these birds as well compared to egg layers. Just things that I think people that are new to meat birds may need to know if they're expecting sweet little hens sitting on nests. These are different birds. Out here with the little Cornish cross chicks. They've been moved out to this chicken tractor. They are all huddled in this space that is less than a quarter of the entire space of the whole chicken tractor. They have all this space to roam and peck at grass and be happy. But this is where the food dish is. And so this is where they huddle. They're all about the food <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> okay, so now that you've decided why you want to have meat birds and now that you've decided or now that you know that there are differences, you have a realistic idea of what to expect. Now it's time to make some decisions. Those are going to be decisions like, are you going to raise them conventionally? Or are you going to try to be more natural and organic? And a lot of that is going to go back to your why. You're going to have to decide if it's worth it to you to spend the extra money for organic feed. Do you even have access to it? That's something you're going to have to consider. We do not have easy access to it where we live. We are very rural Missouri Ozarks. It's just not around here. I can order organic feed through Azure Standard but it's not in our budget. So you're gonna to have to take all those things into consideration when you are making your decisions. The organic natural raising may very well be worth the investment depending on where you're at and what your why is. Now, you're also going to need to decide which breed to pick. Obviously, we've gone with Cornish Cross. You've already seen our little birdies that are out there growing. But I do have a visual I want to show you because I wish we didn't raise Cornish Cross, but there are reasons that that is what we have gone with. And I have a visual I want to show you here real quick that I think will demonstrate why we have gone ahead and gone with the Cornish Cross. So let me show you that. Okay, I have just now pulled some chickens out of the freezer and I want to do a comparison for you guys. This one right here in this little Ziploc baggie is a rooster. We had extra roosters. We had them butchered. These, I cannot roast them. They are way too tough. They must be boiled. It, there are not plump, juicy chicken breasts on this bird here. It has meat and it is yummy but it must be boiled. It is very, very tough, and it's just, it's scrawny, to be honest. Now these here, I've got one small and one a little bit larger. These here, we went with red broilers one year. Um, after a year or two of doing Cornish Cross, I decided I wanted to try something that I thought was more natural, and we went with red broilers. We did actually raise them longer than was told to us, I guess, on the website. And I, they're still small. I was so disappointed in the size. You know, the small ones, 
really they don't have much meat on them the small one and even this was the big bigger one here and it does have more chicken breast to it than the rooster did but still it's just not a plump juicy good roasting bird it's just not here's our cornish cross i've saved a few of them because these are the special ones that i use for roasting i hope we can see through the the ice that is accumulated here on them i have this is a smaller one right here you can see this is the breast meat right there and then this one's a big one so we still had little ones and we still had big ones just like these red broilers but these are so plump so juicy i mean these are the perfect roasting chicken i just really enjoy yeah the chicken breast would be in there that part here i really enjoy the cornish cross cornish cross when they're on the table they are a totally different type of bird when they are alive <laughs> and that's why i'm just not drawn to them i don't know if you have picked up on that yet i like our little egg layers personality and the looks i don't particularly enjoy having the Cornish cross raising them, but they definitely do provide a exceptional meat. Okay, so based on what I just showed you and all the research you're going to do, you will need to come up with which breed is going to work best for you. Do you want to go with a more natural breed? Uh, do you want to just stick with Cornish cross? Some people local to us are trying out uh, American Bress chickens. It's B-R-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. They're a white bird and they're dual purpose and they are really enjoying having them. Supposed to be very sustainable. They are hard to get though. So that would be another option for you to consider if you wanna go a more sustainable route. Again, a lot of this comes back to your why. Why are you doing this? Do you just want meat in the freezer? Do you want that food security where you have a sustainable flock on your homestead for meat? All of these are going to be things that you are going to need to consider for your family. So you've decided on which breed to get. How many do you need to get? So the first thing I have done is I've looked at our family and we typically will go through one whole fryer chicken per week. So. 52 weeks in a year, I go ahead and my goal is to get 60 birds in the freezer for our year's worth of meat. Now, do keep in mind when you are ordering your chicks, though, there will be some losses. More likely than not, you may lose some just after delivery. It, it happens, especially if you're getting them through the mail. And you... You may also lose some just maybe predators, maybe sickness, maybe the weather. There are all kinds of things that can go into play here. And so always order a little more. I do encourage that when to get them. We've changed our plans up a little bit with this. When we first started, we did 30 birds in the springtime and 30 birds in the fall. We thought it would be easier on us to do our birds that way, especially since we were new. And it worked out, it did fine, but I believe that the birds we raise in the springtime do better than the birds we raise in the fall. And I think that is due to the environment. I think the temperatures are more mild in the springtime. We get very hot and humid here in the fall. It's very dry here in the fall. And I just think our birds thrive more in the springtime. So what we have done now, we have transitioned to just getting 100% of our meat birds delivered in the springtime. We grow them out. Eight, nine weeks later, they're butchered and we are done with our meat raising for the year. Now, don't get them too early though, because if they are coming through the mail, and if your area has a cold snap, your little chickies in the uh, post office box aren't going to fare too well. So again, this is a decision you personally are going to have to make depending on your location. 
And then finally, where are you going to order these from? There are so many hatcheries to pick from, you guys. And we have ordered from a bunch of different hatcheries. And I've not had a bad experience with any of them. So I know we have ordered from Welp, uh, Murray McMurray, Meyer Hatchery, Cackle Hatchery. We've ordered from a bunch of them. They've all, they've all done fine. So I have no disparaging remarks to make on any of them. Uh, I do think you need to look at their minimums. Some of them have minimums that you must order. Some of them just don't have certain varieties for sale or they sell out quickly. So those will be things to look for. And I will say one thing that I had a misconception at the beginning and I want to make sure you guys maybe already know this up front. When we first started, I thought, well, we want to order from a hatchery that's closer to our home because then those little chickies won't be in the box and coming to us through the postal system for so long. It'll be a shorter trip. And that's not necessarily true. Um, even if we order from a hatchery in Missouri, the chicks we're ordering, for whatever reason, may be shipping dust from Pennsylvania. I'm guessing they have satellite warehouses or I, I don't know what the system is, but I did discover that that does not necessarily mean it's coming from the hatchery location you're ordering from. So something just to keep, I don't know, just to consider as you're making these decisions. So I hope this was helpful and hopefully it aids you in making your decision. So now we'll move on to the next step. Okay, so you've made all your decisions and your chicks have arrived in the mail. Yay, it's a happy day. They're precious little things. They're sweet, they are fluffy. They look just like the little egg layer chicks at this point, even though they are meat birds. So you're going to care for them just like you would regular egg layers at this point. You're going to provide them some chick starter. You're going to give them all the water they can handle. You're going to dip their little beaks in the water when you first get them, just so they know where the waterer is. And you might add electrolytes into the waterer as well if you choose to. And you're going to put the heat lamp on them. Don't forget the heat lamp. They definitely need that. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to insert a little clip from when we first got our meat birds. This was weeks and weeks ago, but you can see us setting them up or you can see the children pretty much setting them up in our little brooder box inside the shop building and how they got the little chicks going. Now you will notice in this video that we ordered 130. Those were not all for us. Yay roosters. <laughs> One of the things to keep in mind when you are ordering is that there are bulk discounts. If you can go in with friends and order a bulk quantity of meat birds, meat chicks, you can get a better price per bird. That's what we did in this video clip you're going to see from weeks ago. We ordered 130 birds and 60 of them were for us and two other families came and took the remainder of the birds. So look at this real quick and you'll see how we set up our little chicky chicks. Okay guys, look at all of them. They are packed in there and they're noisy. So children are just taking them out and dipping their little beaks in the water so they can figure out where everything is. And then hopefully they'll be happy in here. We'll get the heat lamp on them as soon as we get everybody situated. And then they'll be super happy. Food, water, and warm. All right. We're gonna go ahead and get an assembly line going and get these little guys taken care of. Look at all them babies. Every single one of them was alive and appears to be healthy. So for chicky chicks coming through the mail, that's a really, really good deal. Because sometimes you never know what you're gonna get if the temperatures were bad and they're going through the mail in a box. So I'm happy. 
Okay, we're going to get the heat lamp on them and uh, let them eat and drink. And we're going to go milk a cow. Okay, at this point, we're going to go over some of the supplies that you may need. Now that your new little chicky chicks have come in the mail because you've made all your decisions, I've got helpers here with me now. These are two of my boys, and they're kind of my chicken guys. They help out with chicken chores around here. So they're going to help demonstrate things for Mama today. We'll start off here with the bedding that we use. We choose to use pine shavings, and we just get them, I think we get them from the feed store, right, Andrew? Okay, yeah. They just come from the feed store, and we keep this big old container right there next to the brooder pen in the shop building with this little bucket in it. I think a, maybe a plant or something came in this bucket years ago. And as we need fresh bedding, we scoop it out with a little bucket and dump it out into the brooder box because you are going to need to put fresh bedding down on a daily basis. The little chicks are gonna be pooping in there and they're going to make a mucky mess. And so you will want to put this fresh bedding down every couple days. We like to just empty it out and totally refresh everything that's in there because it does get nasty really fast. Okay, over here, we have some different feeders and waterers that we use with our birds. And these are for different stages of, well, when they're little and when they're big. Some are pretty self-explanatory. We have you know, this feeder here. You just open it up. You fill it up with feed. You close it up. And the little chicks stick their heads in the holes and eat it up. Very easy. But then we've got, let's see, we've got this one right here, this green one that I think is really neat. And, okay, Andrew, can you show us how this one works? All right, so you put your food in here, and, okay, for this side, you put your food in here, and when you put your, the, it's, okay, it's kind of like a lid, okay? So you would have your jar, this is plastic though. Um, a, you could put your feed in here, and it would come out to this side, you'd put water in here, you put it on this side, so it would fill full of water. So it's a dual purpose. You put water in this side and feed for this yeah, side. That's why I like that one because it's dual purpose. You can use it for either one. I like this one because it uses something we already have on hand. We have mason jars on hand. So this would be a feeder. Obviously for smaller chicks, they are going to outgrow this smaller feeder. You'll need something larger you know, like this or even just a feed pan for later on after they get bigger. But this is nice for when they're smaller. And that mason jar, Andrew, it works on these others yes, as well. it works on all three of these. Okay, are these both waterers? These are both our waterers and this is a feeder. Okay, so the feeder is the blue one. Waterers are these, but they all use the mason jar system to hold the contents of what you're giving the birds. And then these here are larger for whenever our birds get a little bit bigger. So, and this one's nice because it can hang or you can just set it up on a block. We do prefer in our brooders to set the, especially the waterers, up on either a concrete block or a block of wood just to elevate it slightly so that the chicks don't get it messy because they'll kick these pine shavings in there quite a bit too. So these are some of the supplies that we're using on our homestead for our birds. Okay, let's talk about a few more issues just on the basic care of your chickens. So, uh, first of all, water. Your chickens need to have water available to them at all times. There should never be a time where your chickens do not have access to good water. You might want to be adding electrolytes or apple cider vinegar to it if you feel the need to do that. Now food. The thing with Cornish Cross is they act as if they are starving every second of every day. And if you choose to feed your meat birds based on the actions of those meat birds, you will go broke on chicken feed and probably kill them from overeating because they can get very, very sick from overeating. 
They can have heart issues and leg issues. They can die from it. But they will convince you that they are starving to death. But they are not. So because you love your meat birds, <laughs> I suggest you only feed them twice a day. And what we use, we went to our feed store and the product that they sell us, it's called Meat Maker. Now, the Meat Maker, my understanding, the way they describe it to us, is it's basically like a chick starter, but a high protein chick starter. I do know there was one time, um, this may have been during the whole 2020 stuff, that Meat Maker was not available. So our feed store had us go ahead and buy Chick Starter for that period of time. So, but Meat Maker is what we typically use. Um, it's very hard for me to give exact measurements on what to feed your birds, because there are so many variables on this. Of course, how many you have, and um, are they free ranging? Are they confined to a small space? Do they have access to protein from bugs and grass? All these things do come into play. Now, I did find a general rule. One bird, one Cornish cross bird, should expect to eat 10 to 12 pounds of food during its life cycle, which should be approximately eight weeks. So depending upon the number of birds that you are raising out, factor in that you will purchase 10 to 12 pounds of food per bird before you get to a butchering date. So we feed ours two times a day, morning and evening. There is a little cup that my husband and boys use to feed the chicks when they're small. And then they gradually build up to those big plastic uh, coffee cans of feed is what they'll get morning and evening whenever they get bigger. Now at the very end, especially if they start using up their, oh, the, the grassy space, the free range space, if they start decimating that area, he will start throwing out more feed to them simply because they no longer have access to grass and stuff at that point. But when they are able to free range these measurements, they work for us. So that's what we do. Um, do need to make sure that you're keeping your chickens warm. Obviously, whenever they're little, they need that heat lamp. My boys are adamant that they must only have a red light on the heat lamp. They do not like the white lights on the heat lamps. They think it hurts the chick's eyes. I don't know. I'm just telling you my boys think the red lights make for happier chickens. So make sure you're taking care of the heat. I'd say with everything we do for our birds, mucking out the broody pens, feeding them, watering them, moving chicken tractors. It might be 30 minutes a day of actual care for these chickens. So I don't think that's that bad, especially for the amount of meat they provide for us. So now I hope you have a little bit better idea of what to expect when caring for these birds. Okay, let's talk a little bit here about keeping your birds safe now. So you've met all their basic needs and you hate to lose them to predators. And the predators that I really think you need to watch out for when they're little will be things, I've got a goat down here, <laughs> goat and some babies here with me. <laughs> when they're little, the things you'll need to watch out for are rats and snakes and cats, something that wants to eat a little chicky chick. Now, as they get older, um, we've lost turkeys, tur turkey poults to raccoons in the past, or hawks. There's all kinds of things uh, predator-wise that could take out your birds. We choose to have Great Pyrenees Livestock Guard Dogs here on our homestead, and I'll tell you, our rate of losing animals has greatly decreased since we've gotten our Livestock Guard Dogs. I really encourage you to have something like that I've got a goat over here sniffing at my leg. So, <laughs> you silly. <laughs> so I encourage livestock guard dogs. Now for when they're smaller, I talked about the uh, snakes and rats and cats. I will show you here in just a few minutes our brooder boxes that we use in the shop building for the little chicks. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by the goat. <laughs> and we have a covering over those to help 
dissuade predators from coming in and eating our little chicks. So those are predators to watch out for. Of course, there's biosecurity of your flock too. Um, it's not a good idea in any scenario to introduce strange animals that are not part of the original flock. And now I have a little baby goat climbing up my leg. <sighs> it's hard out here, you guys. <laughs> so putting uh, new flocks in with an already existing flock could be a recipe for disaster if they have a sickness that they're struggling with. And as far as how to recognize sickness, my biggest thing is if they look lethargic. If they're not up walking around, if when you go out to your birds they don't rush to you because they think you're about to feed them and they're going crazy for food, if you don't see that kind of behavior, that raises a red flag for me. And I'm going to want to check that bird out, maybe set it aside in a separate brooder, give it some apple cider vinegar. You can go with stronger stuff if you need to, uh, products like Corid or there's all kinds of things on the market that you can go to for medicines, but you're going to have to make that choice if you want to go more natural or conventional. So we'll start off next going through the different uh, shelters that we use for our birds at various stages, and we'll get started on that next. Okay, I just want to briefly touch on the different type of sheltering options that you have for your birds. We're going to start off with the little brooder boxes for whenever you first get your chicks. And then we'll move on looking at the chicken tractors that we use and then the free range area that we have. You've already caught glimpses of some of this in previous parts of our discussion today, but we're going to do it officially here at this part. So I'm going to go the shop building behind me is where we have our brooder boxes that we keep our little chicks in. So we'll go in there and I'll show you what they look like. I almost forgot guys let's talk about space requirements here just a second the space that you choose to give your meat birds a lot of that is going to depend on why you're raising your meat birds and what decisions you've made um, I think we all know due to the way birds are conventionally raised they don't necessarily have to have an ample amount of space in order to survive. The factory farmed meat birds have a very small amount of space and you can choose to do that with your flock. That's something that you're gonna to have to make a decision on. So what I'm gonna be showing you here is just what we're doing here on our homestead. We do use brooder boxes, then chicken tractors, and then they free range in a fenced in area. That's what we've chosen to go with. You might have a different setup on yours, but I just wanted to give you an example. So here we go now. Okay, here we are inside the shop building. This is where we keep our little brooder boxes. These boxes, my husband built oh, probably 13 years ago. These things are old, but they are functioning. It's just, he's made it out of wood. And you guys, there are so many options for brooder boxes. If you look online, I'm sure you can find plans, designs for all kinds of things. But this is what we've used for both our egg layers and our meat birds. And this works fine too. So this is what I wanted to share with you today. This is our brooder box. It's, uh, I mean, it has some depth to it there. And it just has that bedding in it that I showed you earlier, those pine shavings. There is a concrete block down there. Uh, it looks like the boys use some extra wood pieces. This would be to elevate the waterer. That's where we put the waterer to try to keep those pine shavings out of the waterer as much as possible. This would be what we put the chicks in at first. And at first when they come to us as little bitty babies, they all fit in here just fine and dandy. Now as they get bigger, we do have a second box just like this one where we can split them up to give them more space and spread them out a little bit while they still need the heat lamp or just protection from being outside at this point. This brooder box, let me see if I can get the lid down. It has a lid on top. And this lid serves two purposes. It's just a wooden frame with chicken wire on it. 
First purpose would be to keep chicks from flying out. As they get bigger and they get more independent, they might try to fly out and this does keep them contained. Uh, secondary, it keeps bad things from getting in. If a cat were to get inside the shop building, or maybe a snake or a rat, this would dissuade them from getting in here to our chicks. I will say a third reason, we have used it on occasion um, to set a heat lamp directly on the chicken wire. If we have had a very, very cold night, uh, we wouldn't even keep the heat lamp elevated at that point. Sometimes we would put it directly down on the chicken wire to give some extra heat to little chicks. So we have used it for that reason as well. So this is what we do for little chicks. Now what I'll do is I'll go out and show you a chicken tractor design, again, that my husband made, and we'll go on to um, what the bigger birds might use. This is another old chicken tractor that my husband has built years and years ago. And this is just comes in so handy. We typically keep this one in our front yard, so it's close to the house. And honestly, it's pretty well used if we need to remove a chicken from the rest of the flock, either a hen that is getting beat up on by roosters or one that's just not looking healthy. We'll put her in here and uh, give her some extra TLC. So this one, since it is sometimes used for our egg layers, our older birds that like to roost, it does have this elevated portion here in the back, and there is a bar for roosting up in it. If we were just using it for meat birds, though, they wouldn't need that roosting area. They would be fine without that. But this is wood and some little wire fencing, some small gauge wire fencing with a lid that just raises up. And this little latch holds it shut. And that's what works. You guys, if you haven't picked up on yet that we're not a fancy homestead, we're not on Pinterest. We're a hillbilly Missouri Ozarks homestead, and this is what we work with. And it does the job. So, see, there's some of my egg layers there. So, okay. Now what I'm going to do is I have some older footage that I have filmed of the other chicken tractor that we do primarily use for our meat birds. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add that older footage from days ago, uh, maybe even weeks ago, in here to show you that chicken tractor and then also the free ranging area that we use for our meat birds. We've got an area here, we call it the birthing pen. We've got ducks and little goats and mamas with their little sheep. And in a separate little area here, we have what we're using right now for our meat birds. And I hope you can see the different areas in the grass where the chicken tractor has been moved. So every day it just gets moved to a, another area of grass and the chickens decimate it <laughs> pretty much and then it gets moved to another area so now we're getting down here with the chicken tractor to the end of this little fenced off area and it has timed out perfectly because this is about the time that we're ready to go ahead and move these out of this chicken tractor here this tractor is just it was made on the cheap guys we are not a fancy homestead here so this is pvc pipe and chicken wire and the tarps are covering it up we got a pretty good rain last night so we've covered up it was totally covered with tarps through the rain and i just opened up this end this morning so they have one more fresh spot of grass over here so this evening they will be moved and then tomorrow they should be released from the chicken tractor and then these birds will have the remainder, this whole entire space here to roam around in up until it's processing time for them. So that is our plan. This is where we go with them once they're too big to be in the little brooder boxes indoors anymore. This is their secondary 
housing and then the third housing is the entire uh, fenced in area so that's our current setup guys okay guys uh, your chickens those meat birds those cute little chicky chicks that you got in the mail it's time to butcher them we're gonna talk about butchering those those little birdies now now with our Cornish crosses we shoot for eight weeks eight weeks is when they should have reached their their weight and you can go longer than that but the longer you go we found they start getting health issues so eight weeks is what we shoot for now if you're doing a heritage breed that American breast that we talked about you're gonna have to go longer than eight weeks so you will need to know that number depending on what breed you chose to go with for when their butchering date would be you need to make a decision on whether you're going to do it yourself or if you're going to outsource it are you going to hire someone else to do that job for you a lot of our friends have purchased chicken pluckers and they have all the materials for doing it themselves we have found a lady we have a local Mennonite community and we have a local lady that will butcher our meat birds for two dollars a bird so I outsource it I don't butcher them myself now whenever I do get them back they come back in the Ziploc baggies I have purchased the shrink wrap bags and for my big Cornish cross those big beautiful roasting birds that I showed you I did invest time to take them out of the Ziploc bags shrink wrap, shrink wrap them so they would store longer in my freezer so I do do that now let's talk about the different ways that you might want to preserve all this meat because for us we have a year's worth of meat you need to make some decisions on what you're going to do on that aspect okay now that you have all this meat from all these birds that have been butchered you need to make some decisions actually you need to have these decisions made ahead of time are you going to leave the whole chickens as whole fryers and are you going to freeze them are you going to cut them up and put the chicken breasts in one baggie and the wings in another baggie and the legs in another baggie you're going to need to make these decisions beforehand how is it best going to be used by your family so think about this do you want to can the meat that's an option for you too so decide how you're going to preserve it because if you do similar to what we do and raise a year's worth at a time you're going to have a lot of meat to deal with right then and there. Do you want to use those shrink wrap baggies like I had talked about before? The last thing, your cost analysis. I really like to every year go through and see how many pounds of meat did I end up with being able to put in my freezer? What was my cost for feed? All my expenses. And when I sit down and go through that, did we make money or not? So I want to touch on that just a little bit here next. All right, guys, if we're going to go over a cost analysis, I want to show you one that we did for our family. This one was back in 2021, and it looks like we went with Freedom Rangers that year. What we did, let's go down here. We had ordered 50 birds from Cackle Hatchery that year. And this is the cost that uh, we paid for those birds. We did lose eight of them, so ended up butchering 42. And it looks like we even waited till 13 weeks for those. Goodness, I didn't even remember that. Um, and we butchered, well, we didn't butcher them. Our uh, Mennonite lady friend, $2 a bird. We did give her a tip. So this was an expense for the butchering. Once we got them home, we weighed each of those 42 birds, logged it, and there was the total weight divided by 42 birds. So that gave us an average of 5.16 pounds per bird. We also made note down here of our feed cost. The meat maker, this must have been the year that the chick starter, um, how many bags we went through, the cost was $256 in feed. So this was our total expense 
for the butchering and the buying of the chicks and the feeding of the chicks divided by 42 birds that made it to butchering. This is how much it cost us per chicken to raise those birds. So again, that total was our expenses divided by the number of pounds of meat that we were able to harvest total. This is how much we spent per pound for the meat birds that we raised that year. I do think it's important for you to do something similar to this. Whenever you do finish your raising of your meat birds, just so, just so you know where you stand. And if you liked a certain breed and a certain time of year, just keep a record of this. So that would be my last little piece of advice for you guys that I can share from our experience. All right, you guys, that's it. That's all I got, that's the end. So I'm really glad I had the opportunity to hang out with you all today. Um, just really enjoyed it. Now, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I would love to go on with this discussion with you guys. You can always find me at Ozark Family Homestead. I'm on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. So just hunt me down and find me there and we can talk about this some more. So thank you so much, guys. Hopefully I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.